passion helps to, to carry you through and keep driving you forward. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 262. And today, our guest is Sensei Thomas Brown. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thanks for spending some time with me in this digital space, listening to the amazing stories from these amazing martial artists that we bring you each week. I have the best job in the world, and if my voice is new to you, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio, and... I love martial arts. So that's why I started this company. That's why I started this show. And that's why we do so many of the other things that we do. You can check out everything we've got going on at whistlekick.com. And you can check out the show notes with photos, video, links, and so much more to every episode that we've ever done, including transcripts. I don't talk about too often, but we have transcripts in most of the episodes. We're going back. We're even doing all of the old episodes of bringing them forward because that's something that we had feedback from you all. If you want to get a hold of us, the best way is to find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are our primary accounts, but of course you can email us. You can email me directly even, jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you want those show notes that I mentioned, because my brain just wandered off on a tangent, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find all that great stuff. If you're not subscribing, you should be subscribing because we put out two episodes a week. We work really hard on that content, and we love the feedback that comes through from all of you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for subscribing. And here's a little hint. If you subscribe, we know about it. We can see it in the numbers as to when you download, really. And watching those numbers go up is really satisfying for all of us here. So thank you for those of you that do that. If you want, you can listen on YouTube. You can listen at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can listen through pretty much any podcast app. You can listen through Spotify. There are tons of ways. And if we've missed one, let us know. We will make it happen. We want to make it easy for you to listen to this great stuff that we've got going on. Let's talk about the show. Sensei Thomas Brown started martial arts as a young boy in the 90s, watching the same movies and TV shows as many of our other guests. But his passion took him on his own unique path. He started in another sport, but ultimately, he chose martial arts. Why? Because he just knew deep in his heart that he wanted more. So let's welcome him. Sensei Brown, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is mine. You know, we were, we were just chatting, listeners, we were, we were just talking, and, you know, it's, it's always fun to have someone who kind of gets the process, you know, the idea of not being overprepared. We've had guests that write down a lot of answers. You know, I can hear them flipping pages. Maybe you can even hear that sometimes in some episodes. And then we have folks who say, wait, you sent me questions? And of course, they're the same questions, but not everyone's familiar with them. And our guest today did the exact, in my opinion, right amount of preparation, glanced through the questions. <laughs> well, we'll see if it turns out being the right amount of preparation. I hope so. <laughs> well, well, we will find out shortly, yeah. won't we? Of course, no stress. You know, this is just us. It's us chatting. It's a it's a conversation between two hopefully pending friends and everyone out there just gets to listen to it and feel like a fly on the wall as we talk about martial arts. Yeah, I, I've been looking forward to it. I've been looking into your your stuff. I checked out your website. I think it's a, a interesting thing you have going on. The, the podcast business model, um, excellent marketing and I say that because it's it's something where you're adding value, not just to your listeners, but to the people that are your guests. And then it kind of becomes a perpetual marketing cycle where I'm assuming your guests then go and, and promote your stuff because they're excited to be a part of it. So I think you have a good business model going on for you. Well, thank you. And, you know, I'm not sure how much they promote the stuff that we do at Whistlekick, at the very least, they tend to promote the episode that they were on. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we're all just, it, it's, it's the martial arts and we're all just trying to help each other out. And, and I think that that's an important piece to find your niche. And, and I love what I do. I love that here it is. Uh, we, we started a few minutes ago, you know, two thirty on a Tuesday afternoon when it's, I, I, I think the thermometer has crested zero here in Vermont. It was 22 below when I woke up. There was frost inside my house, oh. and I get to call this work. <laughs> so what's what's better than it's that? It's been brutal lately. We're not that far apart. Massachusetts, Vermont, 
So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you're staying warm down there. I've got a fire. Well, I, I, I shut it down a bit because it makes some noise, but it's toasty inside right now. Yeah, I've, I've got the heat cranked up here, that's for sure. Good. Good. Of course, this is a martial arts show, and we're going to talk about martial arts. And in order to do that with any kind of context, we need to know about you and the martial arts. So let's go way back, however far that is. And why don't you tell us how you got started? Yeah, so so it was mid, uh, mid-90s. mid was when I got interested, when I got started. Uh, and I'm not sure when you started. Um, I, don't, I don't think, I think we're about the same age, so maybe around the same time period. It was the ninja craze. You know, everything was three ninjas, Ninja Turtles. It was Karate Kid movies still coming out. And I think it was three ninjas. It was the first movie I saw, and I was hooked. Like, I was obsessed with the idea of martial arts before I even set foot in the dojo. I remember nagging my mom constantly, I, I want to do karate. And she'd say, well, when you're older. And it would seem like it was a year that would go by before I'd ask again. It was probably only a couple of minutes. But uh, I, I keep nagging her. She keeps saying, when you're older. And I just remember that moment where she said, all right, let, uh, get ready to go. We're heading out. And I said, where are we going? And she said, well, I'm taking you down to the karate school. We're going to sign you up. And that was one of the most exciting moments in my life. Just finally being able to get enrolled in karate after feeling like I wanted it forever, you know, like a, a kid waiting for Christmas and setting foot in the dojo, even before it was my first class going down there to sign up. I just remember walking in and being in awe of all these kids in their karate geese and belts and my instructor, my, what was going to be my future instructor and his, um, you know, black belt, just thinking, wow, and, uh, yeah, so that's really how I got started. Once, once I was enrolled, I was hooked. So it was something I knew I loved before I did it. And then once I did it, I even loved it, you know, even more. I was pretty much obsessed, constantly practicing, getting in front of the TV in the living room, annoying my family. So <laughs> <laughs> what was it you found in martial arts that really hooked you? You know, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Um, I, I don't exactly know, it, you know, there were other things I was interested in. I did, uh, I did hockey for a while growing up again, that was mighty ducks was coming out and I was addicted to hockey and, and, uh, we did street hockey all the time. And then I was, I played ice hockey for a year. And I remember when we were, uh, the team went to a Falcons game and I was in the stands watching the game with my mom. And she said, you can continue to do martial arts and hockey, but during hockey season, we're gonna have to cut back on your martial arts. Mm -hmm. And it took me maybe 30 seconds. And, and I said, okay, I'm not doing hockey anymore. And I love hockey. I still, we actually have street hockey games every now and then in the back parking lot at the school. Uh, so what was it that got me hooked? Um, I, I don't know. You know, it's just, I, I think it's the level of, self-awareness, self-control that you develop in terms of not just the discipline that I see the kids get and, and, uh, even the adults in classes, but I mean the, just the awareness of how to move your body and having the precision of movement, all of that stuff I think is, is really what got me hooked. The constant mm -hmm. challenge, the new skills that you're working on and then working to develop that precision of movement to accomplish the, the task. Can I ask how old you were when you chose martial arts over hockey? Uh, so I, I started martial arts when I was around eight or nine. And so it was probably around nine or 10 when I made that decision. And I'd been playing hockey since I was real, not on a team, but we would have family games. My, my cousins and my brothers and I would play hockey almost every week, have a game. Uh, so I'd been doing it for many years, but... I just knew martial arts was what I wanted to do. And shortly after starting, uh, I was telling everybody I was going to be a martial arts instructor when I got older. I actually have video evidence of that because my, my brothers and I used to create our own video TV shows, you know, with cheap VHS camcorders. And so there's still some footage somewhere that when I was just starting out, I was already telling people I was going to have a martial arts school and be a teacher. Wow. And, you know, we've heard that from a number of folks. I, I think there's something... And I don't know what it is. And of course, any of the school owners out there 
might be listening thinking, wow, somebody chose to to bail on another sport for martial arts. I mean, that it's typically the opposite. So there was something about martial arts that really resonated for you. And you knew that early on and you're not the only one, you know, here we are 200 and whatever episodes and quite a few of the guests have said that very early on they, they found their, their calling, whether it was calling as a practitioner or as an instructor or a competitor, whatever it was, something just clicked. Yeah, definitely. And I consider myself very fortunate for having that happen in my life. I know a lot of people I talk with, uh, a lot of different students that I've I've sort of mentored through the years that struggle figuring out what is it they really want to do. And, uh, and so to, to find that so young and just know it's what I wanted to do. Uh, I consider that, uh, a very fortunate occurrence in my life. Absolutely. Of course that it, it took me down a, a path that was not necessarily the path I had planned when I was younger. Cause I don't know about you growing up, my martial arts instructor, he was actually a teacher and I'm uh, meaning uh, obviously your martial arts instructor is a teacher, but he was a school teacher by day, martial arts teacher by night. My father had a, a buddy who owned a martial arts school. He had a, a day job. I don't remember what it was, but he had another job by day, taught martial arts by night. And so growing up, I figured this is the path. I'm going to, since I love teaching, that was another thing I knew very early on, even before martial arts, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I know a lot of kids say that, but I, I just, I knew. And, um, I figured, well, I'm going to be a teacher by day, martial arts instructor by night, like my instructor. Then I, I was 19 when I started my business, I was going to school and this is when I, I separated from my instructor to start my own business. We remained connected. Uh, but I went my own way in, in terms of business because that's what I always wanted to do. And I very quickly realized that after I made that decision, I should probably learn how to run a business. And once I started looking into that, I discovered that, hey, this is something other people are doing. I can make a living doing this. And uh, so that's that's when things started to change. And, I'm, you know, again, I consider myself very fortunate that I discovered those things. I made the right decisions at the right moment and things sort of fell into place uh, many times, actually, along the the way to where I am now. There's just certain things that kind of fell into place for me. Such as? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> when <laughs> Almost sounds like we planned it, doesn't it? When, uh, when I was starting out, I was subletting with different gyms in the area. I actually have multiple locations going on with different gyms. And here I am. It's getting towards, I think, the end of my freshman year of college, where this was when, this is back 2006, 2007, uh, when we had the recession, when it hit. And suddenly all these gyms are, are starting to close. So now I'm thinking, oh, crap. Here I am. I'm going to go out of business. I just got started. All the gyms I'm teaching are closing. Of course, in that moment, you think this isn't going my way. So I started looking for other gyms to partner with. And that just wasn't working. They weren't looking to, to partner with me. I was 19, 20 year old kid. And and uh, it was hard to, to actually even just find a place to rent at that age. Uh, but ultimately, that's what happened. Now, if those gyms didn't close, who knows if that would have happened or when it would have happened. But as a result of that, we've now been in the same building for 10 years now. I have a great landlord who's taking care of me and, and we've been able, been able to expand our programs actually a couple of years in. We took over all the upstairs here at the facility I'm in. And uh, so, again, I, I think that uh, it's funny how certain things that you think aren't going your way end up working out. For the best in the end. And so here we are. Mm. Love it. I love those stories. I love how pieces just fall into place for folks. I think that that can give you a lot of comfort, especially as time goes on. When you, when you deal with something difficult, you can look back and say, you know, I, I always seem to end up where I'm supposed to go. At least that works pretty well for yeah. me. Yeah. How about you? Now, do you, do you teach? If you don't mind me, uh, switching things up and ask a couple questions. 
Sure, sure. Uh, I do not have my own school. I did for a couple of years. But my teaching now is confined to a bit of one-on-one that I do out of the Whistlekick facility. And then also just traveling around, you know, there are schools that invite us to come, invite me to come down and, and share some of the stuff that I know. And, you know, once in a while, I'll, I'll, you know, take a class at one of the schools I'm active in, you know, things like that. It's, it allows me to scratch the itch for teaching, but without having that commitment that I couldn't satisfy with Whistlekick and the amount of travel and the other things that are going on because right, of it. right. I think it's that, that passion for, uh, for teaching, too, that helped because I knew when everything was going wrong or what seemed like everything was going wrong, that no matter what, I was going to still teach. I, I was going to find a way to teach, whether it was at another gym, whether it was um, at the time I was going to school. So whether it was out of my dorm, whatever the case was, I was still going to find a way to teach. So it, I think it's important to find what it is you're passionate about. Because in the end, when things are going seemingly wrong, uh, that passion helps to, to carry you through and keep uh, keep driving you forward. I love the way that you phrase that. Awesome. Well, thank you. Here on Martial Arts Radio, it's about the stories. I know you said that you've been checking some stuff out behind the scenes, so you know how story-driven this podcast is. And really, that's just because I like hearing martial arts mm-hmm. stories. And it's turned into a podcast. So I'm hoping you'll indulge indulge me, the listeners out there, and tell us your favorite martial arts story. So this question actually was the one that I've been pondering. I've been I've been thinking about it, and um, I the stories that I I was actually recalling also are martial arts business related. Uh, so I'm not sure in particular what. If it's a sort of an action type story you're looking for, a training story, um, I was having a hard time identifying what what the best story would be. Um, but I, I do have a business story for you. OK, again, when I was just starting out, it, it's to me, it's entertaining. It, it was even entertaining back then, sometimes a little frustrating. So I start my business. I'm a 19 year old kid. And I have a gentleman, if, if you ever watch any of our videos, he's in several of the videos. We call him Moses. That's his nickname. Uh, and he's been with me. I've known him since I started martial arts. So when I started out, he was assisting at the school. And so here's this, this older gentleman and this seemingly young kid. <laughs> so everybody that would come in, they'd turn to Moses. They'd be talking to Moses and saying, so I'd like to get my kid enrolled in classes. I'd answer the question. Then they turn and talk to Moses and ask the next question. I'd answer the question. And so this was sort of a, a, a continual uh, thing, that, a recurring theme that I faced when I was starting out. Now, the, the, what I think is a really funny story is we open up in our own location. Uh, what I was talking about earlier, the, the facility we're in now, we have our open house and uh, a couple parents come in, they want to sign their kid up. Their kid's four years old. Now I usually do five and up, but I'm just starting out. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to take anybody I can. And so I said, okay, well, they can come and try the, the, the class. We can see if it's something that suits them. They could come next Tuesday at four 30. I don't know what the, whatever the time was then. And they said, okay, well, thank you. And, and, uh, we'll come in next week. So now Monday comes at this point, it's, uh, intermediate classes. So they couldn't have been there. I answer the phone because I get a phone call. Obviously, that's why you answer the phone. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it's them. So I say, Tag on Martial Arts, how may I help you? And they start off the conversation. They say, OK, well, we stopped in last week. We spoke with some kid and I go, OK, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and, and let them go on. Uh, I said, OK, yeah, no, no, they can come in for uh for the Tuesday class? Yeah, definitely. He said, yeah, well, we weren't sure. We just wanted to check because we talked with that kid last week. So we wanted to confirm. So now it's the second time they've referred to me as just some kid. And then yet again, I don't remember what was it. I know it was three times. I said, well, actually, uh, I'm, I'm that kid. I'm, I'm the owner. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. And so it's the, to me, that was an entertaining moment, at least in my career. And a bit of a compliment, I think. Yeah, too, yeah. Right? it's, you know, the idea that that 
that I was so young. Someone, yeah, yeah someone came away and, and thought you were really young. And, and you know, I, I think people often get offended when someone thinks you're young. But at the same time, in society, we tend to value that, that youthful energy. And, 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 you know, I could offer some, some other examples from personal relationships that people tend to hold up. But, yeah, to, to be young and energized and owning a martial arts school, I mean, I think that's that's a, a wonderful example to the children. Yeah. It, that they can see someone who doesn't seem, does, at least doesn't appear to be, right? Because, you know, we, we all, quite a, quite a few of us in martial arts have a chronological age and the age that we mm. act. And it's often quite disparate. I mean, there, there's generally a bit of separation between those two. And there's the age of the kids in the classes think we are which is yeah. usually far older yeah. than I want to be perceived. Or sometimes much younger. I mean, here I am, I'm, I'm knocking on 40 and kids routinely at, you know, think I'm in my early to mid twenties and I'll, I'll take that all day long. I'll see. Yeah. You, you look young to me, but not that, not that 40. <laughs> it's working. It's working. Not that, uh, <laughs> would you, so you're how old? I, I'm, I'm 38, and you know what? What's happened is that instead of turning gray, my hair just fell out. That, that's the same problem I'm facing. <laughs> Got to find the right camera angles when we film now. Sometimes I go back and watch the recordings, and ugh. Uh, you just you just gotta you just gotta own it. That's why it's it's shaved down as far as it can be with the clippers. I do it, you know, about every other week, and just just let it go. I had one bottle of shampoo in college and don't even use it now. <laughs> Outside of martial arts, I mean, you know, you mentioned your passion for hockey when you were younger and that you still play some street hockey. Are there other things that you're really excited about? Other things that really engage you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, so it's interesting again for me that early on there, there were certain passions that I think I had that still kind of carry with me today. So martial arts, obviously one of them, uh, teaching in general, now, I'd, I'd be a teacher of something that, that I'm passionate about, regardless of whether or not it was martial arts. Uh, but also when I was younger, I always enjoyed editing videos together, Vi the video editing process more than actually the, the video shoot process. I'm fascinated by that more now with the equipment that we use and different things that we're trying. But I was always interested in editing different videos together. I'd use a double deck VCR and I, you know, I'd cut footage together that way, which is really a hassle. If you, I don't know if you've ever done that or if you could imagine doing that. I have, I have. <laughs> uh, really, really painstakingly. It's just so time consuming. Uh, but I really enjoyed editing something together and then seeing the final result. And so that's that's a significant passion that's still there. In fact, I'm trying to put stuff together for martial artists uh, with regards to learning how to effectively use video, because I think there's certain things martial artists could do uh, better with their video to, to use it to uh, help communicate ideas to other fellow martial artists and also to promote their schools more effectively. Um, so video is one of, one of my passions. Uh, also just personal development in general, constantly trying to learn different things in, in psychology and motivation, personal growth, hugely passionate about that. Always reading something new, taking notes, capturing ideas. Uh, I just recently actually read a, a book just, uh, to recommend for you and, and the listeners, uh, go for no. An interesting book. Usually I don't read fiction. Usually I'm reading nonfiction, personal development, motivation type books. Uh, and this was a, a fiction book. It's a really short book. It's like 78 pages, 80 pages max. And the, the thesis is that in terms of achieving success, many people look at it as they're standing in the middle of failure in success and that they want to go towards success and move away from failure. But the thesis is that mm. the 
actual path that you take is that you go through failure to achieve success in that you should fail more regularly. And, and it references this is more oriented. The book was, I think, written for uh, network marketers and salesmen. Uh, it's the, the idea that instead of setting a quota for yeses that you get for for sales that you close in a week, set a quota for the times that you get told no. And that if you choose to go for the yeses, you might hit three or four, whatever your quota is for the week. And you go, okay, I'm done. But if you set a substantial number of no's, you'll likely end up not just meeting your quota, but going beyond it as well. Hmm. There's a lot of power in no, a lot of power in in letting go of that fear of rejection or failure or however you want to term it. And it's something that seems to really resonate strongly with martial artists. We've had quite a few self-improvement books, you know, kind of like that, that really aren't about martial arts, but at the same time are about martial arts. Yeah. If we assign, uh, if someone learns a new movement and you say, I need you to do it wrong 50 times. That for, for someone who's struggling, you know, especially an adult who's, you know, really second guessing themselves, that idea to do something wrong 50 times rather than I need you to do this right 10 times. Mm. And I think that could really resonate. Yeah, I, I think that what you said, uh, you know, martial arts, I think, is a self-help, self-improvement activity. I think uh, one of one of the masters in, in Kempo who I'm familiar with, I heard say once that, you know, you can learn how to fight. It, it it doesn't take much to to learn how to defend yourself. Um, I think he used the metaphor: you kick a dog long enough, it it'll start to fight back. Um, but at some point, we continue because we want to go beyond that. We're doing it more for for more than just fighting, and I think that's very true. At least it's been my experience, and it's been the experience of many martial artists with which I'm, I'm associated is you stick with it because of the personal growth that you're achieving. Hmm. Agreed. I'd love for you to kind of roll back and think about a time in your life where things were negative. You strike me as a really positive person. You're, you're talking about the good stuff, but I know there's stuff that's on the other end of the spectrum. We all have it, but I find that martial artists have this unique toolkit to handle life's challenges. And I'd love for you to tell us about one of your challenges and how you were able to use your martial arts toolkit. Sure. Um, so at first, when you asked the question, I was like, geez, I don't know. Uh, but actually it, it's a, it's a great question. And I have something that's very specific to martial arts. When I was 16, I was teaching a martial arts class. My instructor was there. I was running the class and, uh, was, I was doing a jump kick and I must not have landed right. I don't, I don't know what happened. And I dislocated my kneecap. Now at this point, I have no clue what's going on. I, I look over at my leg, which hurts and I see, you know, my patella is, is protruding. So to me, it looks like I just, did my leg just snap in two? Is the bone sticking out? What's that bulge sticking out? And my instructor was across the way. And I remember I said to him, um, excuse me, I think I broke my leg. <laughs> and so, uh, he comes over a couple of other adults that are there, come over and stay with me. They they're looking at it. I don't really remember much being said in terms of like, you're going to be okay. Like, I think people are like, Ooh, that's not good. Uh, and I just kind of laid on the floor and my kneecap popped back in and, and, uh, so flash forward because now I've had the injury. The The difficulty was dealing with that injury, not being able to kick. And actually through the years having issues with my knee, I, I ended up a year later, I dislocated the other kneecap. Uh, but in particular, that first injury was such a, an impact, you know, a jumping up in the air and landing. The, the second one was just it kind of got bumped and popped out by somebody I was wrestling with. Uh, but that first injury kind of took its toll on my knee. And I'm doing well now. I've, I kind of overcame it and figured out how to get around it and rehabilitate it. 
But when I was younger, it was a lot more difficult. And when you're in high school, you're very active. Your gym class and even martial arts training, I wasn't as in control of my schedule and being able to say, okay, I need to kind of pull back a little bit right now or I'm going to end up hurt. And so it kept becoming a recurring problem. And the, the real difficulty was when the doctor told me, uh, he was talking about a surgery and, and uh, I, I remember my mom was there and, and uh, she said to me, well, what do you want to do about your knee? And I said, well, it sounds like he wants me to do the, the operation. And he said, no, I don't want you to do the surgery. I want you to stop doing karate. And that moment, I remember getting furious and I might have even yelled at him. I was like, well, I'm, that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. I'm never going to stop martial arts. But dealing with that, and in particular, having a doctor tell you basically that you shouldn't be doing this anymore, and then having to say, all right, well, I'm not going to listen to what you say. I'm going to figure out how to get through this. That, w- that was a struggle. That took years to really figure out how to kind of rehabilitate the knee and get it to where I'm not in pain anymore. Wow. Do you have any lasting effects? Like, are there things that you you avoid doing or extra warm up stuff that you subscribe uh, to? There, there's definitely lasting effects. Um, the the warm up, it, it's not an issue yet. I'm there's certain stretches that I do, certain things that I've learned from different physical therapists that I've I've seen. One in particular that that really helped me, and actually I. Uh, met with him last year and we were talking about injury prevention in general for martial arts. But um, so there's certain stretches that I do still go to uh, foam roller, myofascial release release that helps um, yeah. as, as far as lasting effects. I do know. OK, I shouldn't do too much kicking. I can feel I'm starting to get a little irritated. Maybe I should call it a day with the, with the kicking, take a day off and, and work up our body or whatever. So I'm more aware of what's going on down there now too, but lots of kicking deep stances and things like that. Definitely, definitely can uh, take its toll and irritate it. Did that, you know, when you, when you look back, do you think that that this has changed the way you approach your training? Uh, it's definitely changed the way I approach my teaching. I do a lot of injury prevention stuff with my students because I'm more aware of, of what can go wrong because I've been fortunate or unfortunate, however you want to look at it, of having many different things go wrong with my body through the years as far as uh, joint injuries and such. So I'm more aware of that, like I said, and I implement certain stretches and in different physical conditioning, different uh, strength development protocols to help make sure that that people are avoiding imbalances and in uh, avoiding injury as such. Hmm. Nice. And I'm curious, what what's the response from your students? Injury prevention isn't something that we do much of in the martial arts, just generally. So I'm curious what feedback you get from your students. Not too too much. Um, I I don't think they know the, the difference. I do introduce them to why we do it. I'm really big on that. I'm principle-centered in everything that we do. I want the students not just to know what to do. I want them to know why they're doing it. But I don't know... You know, when it when it's something that you're always familiar with, when you don't know anything else, when that's what your training is, there's no significant response. If maybe if a student comes from another school and now they're introduced to this new way of training, which I, it isn't radically different. It's just making sure that, that you're doing certain in particular, certain stability exercises with all all your joints to make sure that you're not just developing the explosive movement, but you have the, the strength to stabilize that structure when you are performing that explosive movement. Uh, but it's not too radically different. Like I said, just more stability training in, in all areas, proprioception training. Um, nice. Cool. We haven't talked much about 
your instructors? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about your, your initial instructor. Yet, martial arts clicked for you. And you might be the first, but but perhaps not. It seems like everyone has at least one person that, you know, when they think back on their past, if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't have stuck with martial arts. You know, quite often it's that first instructor who who really just sets the path out for us. For, for others, it could be a coach. I mean, there are a lot of possibilities, and we've heard so many of them on this show. Is there someone like that for you? Someone that when you think of, you say, ah, I really needed the lessons that they gave me. Definitely my first instructor. And he actually, so I don't want to get emotional here. He actually, last year, I was teaching class and I, I got a message that he passed away and it was really sudden. He was only in his 50s. Uh, so it was, it was sudden and, and, and shocking for all of us as former students and especially as current students. I can't even imagine the, the younger ones. I tried to put myself in their place thinking, geez, if I was a little kid and that happened, I lost my sensei. What would that do to me? Um, so that was that was another tough time, actually, dealing with that. But he definitely sort of laid out a path for me. He helped me in, in many ways. I learned how to to be a not just a successful martial artist, but a successful teacher from him. Uh, mm. And what's interesting, actually, is going back to how certain things happen that, that lead you in a direction. Uh, he helped sort of lay that path as, as far as teaching was concerned. When I was going to school, he helped me set up the, the different programs. Meanwhile, I was going off to college. He helped me set up the different programs at those, those gyms that I, I was teaching at. And when he passed away, he, he was teaching at a gym at that point. He was getting towards the end of his career. So he'd closed up his school. He was going to retire, uh, but he was teaching a few last people um, out of a gym in Westfield. And so now we have another program that we're running in Westfield. So again, it's interesting, you know, even in his passing, he's still kind of giving my life direction, taking my career in new ways, but he was definitely very influential. I learned a lot from him uh, as far as having proper energy when you're in front of classes, keeping the students highly engaged and wanting to come back. So I owe him a lot. That's for sure. Nice. And if you could train with someone else, someone that you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? So anywhere in time, if we're looking at people from the past, obviously I, I would find it difficult to believe there'd be any martial artist that wouldn't want to meet and interact with Bruce Lee. So he'd be on that list. Uh, but being that I come from a Kempo background, I would love to have met Ed Parker. I, uh, he's somebody that I greatly admire his contributions to the martial arts, his theoretical understanding. Uh, I think he was a conceptual genius in in his approach to developing his system. And so I would love to, to just meet him and train with him and, and be able to, in particular, do what we're doing right now is to sit down and ask him a bunch of questions. I'd love to interview him and see how his mind works, try to get to be better understand his process. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Parker's certainly on that short list of folks that, man, I wish I'd started the show just a little, little bit sooner. Yeah, definitely. I, I wish there were more videos out there of him. I, I, I think that nowadays so many of us are putting videos out there that in future generations our students, students, and, and so forth and so on will be able to still see what we were teaching and how things were. I'm happy that he was able to shoot some videos. I, I love that uh, Larry Tatum, one of his top protégés, has so many videos out. I wish there were more of Ed Parker teaching. Mm. Mm. Fortunately, there are still quite a few people who train directly under him. So while, while it's not the same... We're still, we're, you know, you can still kind of read between the lines when you when you get half a dozen or a dozen people together who 
all trained under the same person, you can start to see the commonalities and say, ah, they must have gotten that from so. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and sometimes you can see the exact same lesson being taught when you do have that reference material that is out there of him and you see that, OK, they're explaining the exact same thing and maybe they're expanding on it a little. And so it's. It's definitely still there. I think that there's a lot of people that are keeping his teachings alive. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about competition. Tends to be a bit of a polarizing question on this show. People usually love it or very uh, diplomatically dislike it. Where do you fall? So I I wouldn't say that I fall in an extreme. Uh, I'm definitely for competition i don't we don't overly emphasize it here at our school we have our own little tournament used to be every year Uh, i've been kind of getting away from doing that i have so many projects going on but i see tremendous benefits in it and i i think it's also okay if there are schools out there that, that don't do it i think that there's different reasons that people train and i think what's really important is that you get clear on what you're offering so that people can make sure that what they're getting from you is in line with the reasons that they want to train, that they want to participate in martial arts. So if people want to be competitive, they better make sure they find a a competition oriented school. If they want to learn how to defend themselves, there better be practical training, sparring, and maybe even a a little bit of competition mixed in with that. Uh, So for me, Well, one thing when I was younger, we'd do tournaments and compete. After I injured my knees, I became a lot more cautious, especially the second time when I was just sort of wrestling around with somebody and they popped my kneecap out. Uh, I, for me, I prioritize being able to continue to train over being able to compete. But one of the reasons that we do have tournaments and one of the reasons I'm for tournaments is getting students to step out of their comfort zone getting them to do something that that forces them to confront their ability to still perform adequately under stress, under pressure. And a lot of kids, when we're having tournaments, there's a lot of kids that don't want to compete, that are afraid of getting out there and competing. And what I've found is when I'm able to talk some of those kids into it. Usually when there's this one kid that's absolutely, ah, they want to do it. They were even going to do it, but then it's absolutely, no, I'm not. I'm too nervous. I'm too scared. And when I can talk that person into competing, they end up taking home a trophy and they end up performing better than, than most. And so I think that that a, a huge value is being able to just get up, whether it's sparring or performing forms and do what you've been trained to do in an environment that pushes you outside of your comfort zone. And I I think as far as achieving success in life, we have to constantly push ourselves beyond our comfort zone because either we're expanding our world or it's going to start shrinking in on us. Mm. I love that. That's so well put. We've had a number of folks come on the show and say that in, in very different ways, but I really like the way that you put that, you know, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not swim, you know, sharks, if they're not swimming, they're dying. If you're not growing, you're shrinking. There's a lot of different dichotomies that you can use for that analogy. And there's a fear, isn't it, to doing whatever it is that we're uncomfortable with, the things that we don't do often, regardless of our age, regardless of our rank. And the irony is, as we move up in age and rank, we almost seem to be more afraid of tackling those new challenges. Oh, definitely. And I think that the physical and the the mental, it's interesting how they're linked because I see as, you know, as you get older, you lose your physical flexibility, but also if you're not careful, as you get older, you lose your, your, your mental flexibility, your mind starts to tighten up and you're not willing to accept new ideas. Uh, I put a lot of content out online and I find that those that have been in the martial arts the longest, And let me not generalize. It's not if you've been in the martial arts the longest, this is going to happen. But I'm sure, you know, you you have 200 and something episodes. 
you must have encountered people that disagree with ideas that you're sharing and feel the need to of course. feel the need to email you or I don't know how podcasts work if you can comment on them. I've never we we just did an episode uh within the last couple of weeks all about the hatred that that we get and why we let some criticism end up being posted publicly and others we take down and and, and oh yeah yeah that's actually oh, yeah, the, yeah. That's... it's I, I wake up in the morning to hate mail me too <laughs> yeah and so what i was gonna say is i think there's a couple different people that fall into that group there's those that just don't do anything that they're stuck too afraid to push themselves forward in their life to kind of expand out of their comfort zone that it's easier to attack those that are doing something that they're kind of jealous of the fact that they're doing it. And then I think there's those that have attained success that when they see something new, like I was saying, their mind is kind of tightened up. And so to admit that, Hey, there might be this new idea or a new way of expressing an old idea, which is really, I think what happens more often than not, uh, when they see that they reject it because it, they don't realize that, with age, they've lost that mental flexibility and, and they're becoming more closed minded to, to new ideas. I think it's sad. But I know plenty. I do want to reemphasize. I think that the percentage of people that do this is actually small. When you look at how many people there are, the, the sad thing is the majority of people that comment online are the negative ones. And I think that they are a smaller demographic. But because they're the ones that comment, it feels like it's everybody. So I, I know plenty of martial artists that are open minded. I train with several different schools and I have different instructors that I train with continuing up my training. And, and they're very open minded. They know what I'm doing. They help me figure out how what they're teaching fits in with what I'm doing. And in there they have that that mindset that the arts should continue to push forward. And so uh, I definitely don't want to generalize and say if you've been in the martial arts for a long time, you're not open to new ideas. No, for for sure. And your point about the negative comments being a small percentage, you're right. It, and if we think about it, when do we contact a company? Mm. The rare occasion when we were just so blown away and we had the time and, you know, we really wanted to support them, we might say something positive. Or, for a lot of us, when they do anything at all wrong. The majority of, of exchanges, you know, you go to the grocery store, you buy your groceries and everything's just fine. You're not going to that, that that's what's expected. So we don't tend to give feedback when things are good. We give them when they're super duper great or they're bad. Yeah, definitely. Really and, and there's this new trend. Thing. Um, I don't know if you're a, a member of Century Martial Arts School group on Facebook. I, am. I I see so many people that they have an issue with something and they decide to post it on the group. And I just, I just don't get that mm -hmm. as far as when you feel frustrated with a company, like you were saying, and you, you sort of jump into that. I need to, I need to complain or I need to post a, a negative review. It's now getting, well, I'm going to contact the company with my issue, but instead of contacting them to see if it can get resolved, I'm going to make it a, a, a matter of public record that this is an issue I've had to see if I can get sort of that mob mentality to jump in and, and support me. And I just think that's going about it the wrong way. Yeah. And you know, the irony is um, someone that I know not well, but someone that I know did that, did that very thing. And, and it, it doesn't take long to figure out that whistle kick and century are competitors, at least when it comes to selling sparring gear, you know um, what a lot of folks don't know is that, Leon Rogers, who's one of the VPs over there, he and I have a great relationship and we talk, you know, a few times a month, just a really nice guy. And he's been really supportive of Whistlekick and, you know, where do I buy, Whistlekick doesn't make uniforms, so where do I buy mine? Generally, from Century. Yeah. And this particular individual posted something and, you know, I reached out to, to Leon at Century and said, you know, this, I, I was really saddened that this person did that and, you know, not, not covering for them because it's not someone I know that well, but the exchange just seemed so counter to what I knew of this person. Mm. And, you know, we don't always know what's going on in people's lives. And I think that the semi-anonymous 
frame of the environment, uh, I'm sorry, of the internet allows us to, you know, lash out in a way that we never would in person. I have a rule when I'm communicating with people and I don't think anyone out there knows, you know, has, has experienced this because I have good relationships with pretty much everyone that I think is going to be listening to this. But if I'm writing an email or a text and I start to feel any kind of negative emotion, I will delete what I'm writing and ask for at the very least a phone call, if not a meeting in person. I think that's a good rule. Yeah. Because it goes sideways so quickly. Especially when you can misinterpret the written word so easily, too. So even if it's just partially mm-hmm. there's a little bit of negativity there, frustration or whatever that emotion is, that could be blown out of proportion very easily. And it's so important that we have these strong relationships, not just in life, but especially in martial arts. It is so easy to get put into a camp and not talk to others in other camps. And we look at styles, we look at geography, we look at the million and one ways that we are divided. Mm. You know, when some, and there are, there are growing efforts to bring some common ground, some unity to the martial arts. You know, this this show, Whistlekick, in general, is one of those efforts, but there are so many others. And I just want to, I want to connect people. I don't want to draw more and more lines between, because at the end, you're just left as one person in your own little box. Definitely. Yeah, I, I advocate cross training and, and experiencing other systems. It's a big part of what we do. Um, I wouldn't advocate trying to become a master of every system that wouldn't make sense, but training in other systems, taking seminars and, and, and things that push you again outside of your comfort zone to experience something new. It, it's something that I try to do on a, a fairly regular basis. And I've learned to sort of fall in love with the uh, experience of that feeling like a student again, sometimes, when you reach a certain point, you can start to feel like either you have all the answers or yet you definitely have uh, more than you think you do. And so to put yourself outside of your own world and into another system that that can be really humbling really quickly. And, and so I, I like continually doing that in my career, in my training, uh, just to kind of keep me grounded Nice. You mentioned earlier your affinity for any ninja movie from the 90s. You mentioned Three Ninjas Mm -hmm. specifically. It's a movie that a lot of us have seen, a lot of us love, despite, you know, it's kind of quirky. (laughs) (laughs) Is that your favorite martial arts movie, or are there other films that occupy, you know, your top spots? So it's interesting because I've definitely, I've rewatched that movie recently in recent years because during camps and things that we have at the school here i'll have the kids watch it so they can experience it too and i'm still there's definitely nostalgia there i actually do still enjoy the movie i do like it um i love the karate kid movies i love enter the dragon i don't know if i could pinpoint like this is my favorite go-to martial arts movie though but i i definitely up there is enter the dragon the Karate Kid series. Uh, I'm, again, partial to a lot of those movies that I grew up with. I still love the 1990, I think it was, Ninja Turtles movie. Not the biggest fan of the new movies that are coming out. I've I've seen them. Not sure if I should admit to watching movies that are more geared towards kids, but I think I'm like... You absolutely <laughs> should. Absolutely. I have, I've definitely watched them and been somewhat disappointed, so... What's your favorite movie, martial arts wise? It depends on on why it's my favorite because they they're not all the same. You know, the the original Karate Kid is the one that I think has had the biggest impact. It's the one that I am most likely to watch if I'm flipping through channels and mm. it's on. But it's certainly not the best choreography. It's not the best acting. Yeah. It doesn't have the best story. You know, the reason I asked about Three Ninjas is because there seems to be this correlation between movies that you watched at a certain point in your martial arts career, you know, that early time. 
for a lot of folks, it's it's Bruce Lee. People that watch Bruce Lee films at or before they started training, quite often that's the movie that holds that favorite space for <clears> them. <throat> you know, I think there's something to be said for for that just kind of overall culturally we tend to love the music that came out when we were teenagers when we got to make our own choices for the music we were listening to clothing you know we tend to stay in 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 this it's more likely to change but a lot of us will stick towards the clothes that we were able to buy when we first had our own disposable income you know teenagers or, or maybe even a little bit older yeah and i i think that's why karate kid is that movie for me i mean i'll watch anything with a great fight scene or anything with a great story it doesn't have to be all of those together yeah i'd have to agree i mean the the movies that i go to in my mind when you ask the question are the movies that i watched early on so i'm still partial to three ninjas enter the dragon i remember always watching that whenever i was getting ready for a tournament so that was my sort of go-to tournament movie hmm yeah, so that's a perfect example. A movie that hypes mm. you up. You know, if I'm going to go out and train, you know, I might watch a training sequence from, you know, one of Van Damme's movies. You know, one of the, the 80s montages. Movies today don't have great I montages. I love the montage. We, we need more montages. I wish someone would make like a... a maybe, actually, maybe it's out there. Somebody show me like 60 minutes of fight scene montages. You know, not 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 the actual fight scene, but like the, the training, you know, just somebody that's uploaded all of those best chunks to YouTube, and I, I'll just watch that all day. As far as a, a Kempo montage goes, and I'm actually not about to plug my own stuff here, as the listeners might think. They're... But you can. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's, there's one from uh, an instructor... In, that I'm familiar with. He's an excellent instructor. It's called Kempo Rocks on YouTube, and it's a training montage. He made it when he was celebrating, I think it was his 20th year in the martial arts, and it's definitely it's a great martial arts video. kind of gets me psyched up for training in martial arts. He's in incredible physical condition. I mean, he does pull-ups where he launches himself up into the air and then claps and then catches the bar, stuff that I would just wreck my shoulder trying. But uh, it's a great montage. You should check it out if you haven't seen it. Cool. Yeah, we'll we'll find it. We'll add it to the links. For anyone that might be new, you can find the show notes to this or any of the other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we drop links like this Kempo Rocks montage, photos, all the other good stuff we do. Now, if you want to see a montage I put together for my school, I can also give you a, sure. a link to that as well. Yeah, yeah. But as far as training on. goes, I I think that his is is a really really well done video. Who's your favorite martial arts actor? Favorite martial arts actor, probably Bruce Lee. It's interesting these questions too. I did see him on the list, so you know earlier you asked me story, and that one was difficult. And then the 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 movie thing it was difficult too because when I was younger, I was much more into watching the martial arts movies. That's kind of slipped away where, yeah, like you said, I love seeing a good fight scene. I love I love watching different movies that have martial arts in them, but I'm not as addicted to watching martial arts movies as I was when I was younger. I'm, I'm much more busy working on training and building my business and, and uh, any other projects that I have going on. So it's kind of fallen out of my schedule. Mm. There's something to be said for watching martial arts movies with other martial artists. And I've heard of some martial arts schools that will, you know, once a month or so have a movie night in the school, whether that's for kids or teens or adults. But I think there's something kind of fun about watching a movie like that together. And then even, you know, at class the next week, pulling some elements out of that to work on it. it, it there's, you know, watching a movie by yourself, that's one experience. But I think we've all been to the movies and especially with a funny movie, you can exp you can feel it more there. You watch a funny movie by yourself, you laugh. You watch a funny movie in the theater with everyone else laughing, you will fall mm. out of your seat. It's just a whole different experience to share that with someone. And I think you can say the same about martial arts films. Yeah, my, I mean, my only fear is that students will realize that that's where our whole curriculum came from. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're showing them the perfect weapon, maybe. 
And maybe it should. I actually, uh, I've, I've never well, taken a class some awesome in my life. In there. It's, I've just documented different things that I've seen in the movies and thrown it together. I've paid different people to pretend to be my instructors in videos just so that I can create this backstory too. It's really elaborate. There you go. Well, you know, if, if you have them start shin kicking palm trees, <laughs> then, then they may have the proof that they need. How about books? Are you at all a reader? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I, uh, I have all of the Bruce Lee with the John Little Bruce Lee books where he documented his notes, mm. the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, Ed Parker's Infinite Insights into Kempo, Encyclopedia of Kempo, um, Master Young, because I do White Crane with YMAA. So Master Young has several books. I have his Chin Na books, his White Crane book. Uh, basically just about anything I can get my hand on, uh, books, DVDs. I have a huge DVD library of, of different martial arts videos, uh, instructional. So anything that I can consume that can help me better understand what I'm doing. Cause usually I find that that's what you're attempting to do in that environment. It's not that I'm reading this book to, to learn a whole bunch of new skills. If that's what I'm doing, that's probably a flawed approach because it's pretty hard to learn from a book. But if this book can give me greater insight into, okay, this is what they're doing in their system and I understand why they're doing it now, maybe I can make a connection with something that I've been doing for years and I can see it from a, a new perspective that gives me a greater depth of understanding. Uh, that's, that's my approach. What are your goals for the future? Well, oh, this one's making me think. Um, That's half the fun I, for me. I know. Um, and, well, one of the reasons it's making me think is how much do I want to actually say? Because there's, there's different research that depending on talking about your girl, goals with people, it can help you achieve them or it can actually kind of connect in your brain like, OK, I get that sort of hit of that same feeling you get when you've accomplished it. And now you become less likely to actually achieve the goal. I think that the a key there is making sure that the people that you are sharing your goals with, are going to hold you accountable. Uh, I mean, so some of my bigger goals with the school, of course, I want to constantly continue to develop my depth of understanding so that I can continually improve my teaching methods and help my students get better and better. I look at the students that I have now, and when I think back to when I was at, you could pick any any level, uh, not necessarily beginner, but if we look at intermediate advanced students and I compare to where they are versus where I was when I was their level, they're beyond where I was. I think my teaching and my understanding has evolved that I'm able to, to take the next generation a little bit further. And so I'm constantly working on, on trying to improve upon that. Not the most tangible goal. It's it's hard to exactly define what the criteria is, but that's that's in the the list of goals. It's on it's in one of my my journals, which I write down goals in. Uh, another thing is I, I want to continue to release online courses. This year, I want to release at least three. And right now, we're getting ready to release one on understanding power dynamics. I have a background in, in physics. That's what I was going to school for before I realized I could run a, a martial arts business. And so I'm using my knowledge of physics combined with what I've learned from my different instructors to explain conceptually in terms of the principles what power dynamics are. And so that course, actually, I'm not sure when this is going to air, when you're going to be releasing it, uh, but it'll probably be up on my website by the time people are listening to that. We have a course on, on Shaolin White Crane Fundamental Training. And again, these courses really focus on principles because that's my philosophy, my approach in my own training when I'm consuming books and, and video is to understand the principles and how it fits in with my training. And so I'm trying to provide the same resources for uh, those that are, are taking a similar approach in their training. Uh, so that's a big goal. I'm passionate about teaching, like I've said a couple times. And so I want to teach, I want to make available all the resources that I can to help people be successful in their training. Nice. And if people want to reach out to you, if 
you know, they, they want to check out those courses, you know, social media, email, website, any of that? What do, what do you have? Well, they can, they can go to the web, my website, which is tygonkarate.com. Uh, they can email me directly at tom at tygonkarate.com. They could go to the, my Facebook page, which I'll, I'll give you links to all of this. They can learn more by going to our YouTube channel. We have upwards of around 300 videos up now. Uh, and now that it's a, a new year, I'm getting ready to get things going and start adding some new content there this week. And That's so great. there's a lot of ways that people can reach out, out to me. And some final words for the folks listening. So I guess in, in keeping with what has been a recurring theme in our discussion, I would say as you go forward in your training, keep an open mind and uh, consistently expose yourself to new ideas, push yourself outside of your comfort zone uh, and, and uh, try different things so that you're continually experiencing growth and you don't find yourself moving backwards. Sensei Brown is such a positive person. His passion for teaching is exceptional, and I'm impressed at his choice of martial arts over hockey. All too often, I see children choosing nearly anything over martial arts. But here we see Sensei Brown choosing it as a child and turning it into a career that he loves. Thank you, Sensei Brown, for being on the show today. You can check out the show notes with everything we've talked about today, photos, and a whole bunch more at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all of our great products, links to our other projects online, like Martial Arts Calendar. You can find those at whistlekick.com. And if you want to get a hold of us on social media or see all the cool memes and everything that we're putting out every day, you can find us at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hopefully you're subscribing to the show, you're subscribing to our newsletter, and you're seeing all the great effort that we're putting in to make your life, your passion of the martial arts better. Because really... That's our goal. That's all I've got for you today. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.